So we have finally gotten to it where we have in the upper room Jesus appearing to the apostles. Throughout the liturgy since Easter Sunday, we've been reading the accounts of the resurrection, and each day the day has been getting later and later and later. And the church does that because from Easter Sunday to the Sunday after Easter, now known as uh, Divine Mercy Sunday, we call this the octave, the eight days of Easter. Each day of this week is Easter Day. And so the church kind of arranges the readings in such a way as the day gets longer and longer and longer. We begin with the women coming to the tomb while it's still night or still dark to anoint his body. And then we move throughout the day. We finally reach the evening moment when Jesus appears in the upper room to the 12 apostles. Now, it's interesting to know, St. Uh, Saint, uh, Venerable uh, Fulton Sheen made the point that the Pharisees, who did not believe that Jesus was God and did not believe in the Jesus being the Messiah, asked Pilate to station guards at the tomb to make sure that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. So here the Pharisees who don't believe that Jesus is neither God nor the Messiah have uh, guards stationed at the tomb to make sure that he didn't rise from the dead. So uh, the Pharisees who didn't believe Jesus is God believed in the resurrection from the dead. And the apostles who believe Jesus is the Messiah, is the Son of God, were locked away for fear because they didn't think he was going to rise from the dead. And they were quite shocked when they found out he did. And actually, they spent the day in a lot of disbelief, right? We had the women who went to the tomb. They didn't find Jesus. They saw the angels. They asked, why are you seeking the living among the dead? Then eventually, Mary Magdalene beholds our Lord. She clings to his feet. The Lord says, don't yet cling to me. I'm not sending my father. And then she goes back and tells the apostles. John, John and Peter run to the tomb. They find it empty. Now, John does say he believed. Uh, but he saw the, you know, the cloths, the shroud folded up in the corner, but still they were incredulous. There was a disbelief happening there. Somewhere along the line, we learn from Cleopas in his conversation on the road to Emmaus that our Lord appeared to Simon. What took place in that conversation, we don't know. Then our Lord appears to uh, the two on the way to Emmaus just before dinner time. And then when they discover it's our Lord and the breaking of the bread, they run back and they're in the upper room. They're telling their story. Peter's telling his story. Everyone's kind of sharing. And there's still some disbelief. And yet there's still this hope that it might be happening. And suddenly, from behind locked doors, as the apostles are gathered there, our Lord is standing in their midst. Our Lord is standing in their midst. And after these three days of betrayal, denial, fear, doubt, despair, really three days of what was for them darkness, sadness, despair, a horrible tragedy, witnessing the, the crucifixion of Christ, a horrible execution, not just of man, but of God. There he is. This darkness and everything else is met with this incredible presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord doesn't scold them for not being there at Calvary. He doesn't scold them for abandoning him. He doesn't scold them for any of the behavior. Now, we're told they took him a little to task with a disbelief. But his first words out of his mouth are peace Peace be with you. This is something we will repeat every single Mass for the next 2,000 years, right? From the day of the resurrection until today. We begin with, the peace of the Lord be with you. Peace be with you. We express at Mass to everyone. And you say back to the priest, and with your spirit. There is this exchange of peace. Grabbing the words of our Lord from the resurrection of the dead, we say it at Mass. Asking the Lord to distribute that peace of the grace of the resurrection. The peace that comes from knowing the fact that our Lord rose from the dead, that he conquered sin and death. The peace that comes from knowing the forgiveness of sins. The peace that comes from knowing the love of God for us. The peace of knowing that we are loved by God unto death, death on a cross. 
the peace that comes from knowing that the Lord has sent upon us the Holy Spirit to live lives of virtue, to live lives of holiness. The peace that comes from no longer being in the captivity of sin. The peace that comes from the waters of baptism. That we have become true and real, adopted children of God, heirs to the kingdom of heaven. The peace that comes from the gift of the state of grace. The peace that comes in being able to maintain that state of grace through peace in God, in relationship to Him. It's the peace that comes from knowing that when we do fall to mortal sin or any other sin, unfortunately, that we happen to fall to it, there's a peace knowing that God's mercy is waiting for us in the sacrament of confession. And that that state of grace can be restored to us. The peace that our Lord comes to bring is not as the world brings peace, as he himself said. It's the peace that comes from God himself. This world can only give so much peace, right? You can have peace between nations when they get along and so forth and so on. And that's one form of peace. And God willing, our world comes to peace. You can have peace between neighbors. You have peace within the family. There's a certain peace that could be there. The absence of strife, the absence of war, the absence of battle, the absence of tension. That is a form of peace. But the deeper of peace comes from the intensity of the bond of love. We were once enemies with God, Scripture says, because of sin. But we've been reconciled through the blood of Christ. The peace we have now with God is not simply some sort of peace treaty between God and man, as if we're no longer at war with each other. It's a peace that comes from the reconciliation of the world to the Father through the offering of Christ Jesus on the cross, through his death, through his resurrection. This is where peace truly comes from. The peace in the heart that knows its sins are forgiven through the mercy and goodness of God. The peace that comes from knowing the depth of love that God has for humanity. The depth of love God has for us. Peace be with you, he says to them. And then the Lord asks a good question of them. He says, why are you troubled? <laughs> right? They're seeing him. They think he's a ghost. You know, I mean, he was crucified. He was buried. And, and, and there's all these reports. And, you know, he says, that, why are you troubled? <laughs> why are we troubled? Right? I think our Lord asks us that question a lot in our lives, right? When things are going crazy in our families, things are going crazy with the job or this or that. Things seem to be going crazy with life. Things are going crazy in the world right now. Our Lord asks that same question of us. Why are you troubled? Now we can give a long list of why we're troubled. we got a lot of things we can tell the Lord why we're troubled. And I think the answer that he gives to that why are you troubled is you don't need to be troubled because you know now the full revelation of the love of God for you. You have no need to be troubled. You have no need to be afraid. You have no need to be worried. And we can go through all the Gospels of everything that our Lord said about not being afraid, not being troubled, not being worried, and so forth, and bring it to this point of the revelation of God's intense love for us on the cross and a gift of his resurrection to explain why we should not be worried or troubled or filled with anxiety because of the love of God for us. And it's so beautiful because the Lord then invites them, look at my hands, look at my feet. He shows them his hands, he shows them his feet, he shows them his side. Now the scourge marks are gone, the bruises are gone, all that's gone. But the Lord keeps the wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side. They will never heal. They are there for all of eternity. The wounds in his hands, his feet, and his side are there for all eternity as the covenant cut in his flesh, as the testimony of his love for sinful humanity, as the testimony that he is a God that can be trusted, a God who loves us, a God who has cut into his own flesh the new covenant of his love, the covenant of mercy. When we behold the sacred body of Christ, we see 
a human body that has been caught in the hands, his feet, and his side. Wounded for us, wounded for our transgressions because he loves us to redeem us. And so when we see the sacred wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ, we fall upon mercy. And all the guilt and blame and all that stuff we bear, we bring the confessional because we know that God is a God of mercy who will forgive us. So beautiful. So much more we can say today, but let's just sit with those beautiful words of our Lord. Peace be with you. Why are you troubled? Those two questions, right? Well, two questions and two statements. Peace be with you, first of all. To reflect upon that peace that only God can give. The peace that comes through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that comes from the forgiveness of sins. The peace that comes from knowing the love of God. And then look at all those things. Why are you troubled? Have our Lord ask us that question. Why are you troubled? And take all that trouble that we owe, the reasons why we have to be troubled, anxious, and all the other stuff, and bring it before our Lord. Look at his hands, his feet, and his, and his side. And know we have nothing to trouble us, nothing to cause us fear, nothing to worry us, nothing to cause us anxiety. Because our Lord, has loved us unto death and unto life in the beauty of the resurrection. May God bless you and Merry Christmas.